Hi, this is Stuart Weems and welcome to the Investopoly podcast. My goal is to give you simple, easy to understand strategies, insights and tips to help you master the game of building wealth. And in this episode, I'd like to talk about why you should be saying no a lot more often than you should be saying yes uh, when contemplating making an investment. Uh, There's obviously a number of factors that I like to consider when contemplating making an investment, either on behalf of my clients or whether I'm doing it uh, myself personally. And I think it's really important to consider a vast array of investment opportunities or, of course, appoint an advisor to do that on your behalf. But it's even more important to discount most of those investment opportunities, that is, not pursue them. In fact, setting a high bar and being diligent Uh, And being disciplined to stick to a fundamental approach is absolutely critical for success. Uh, And that's what I want to talk about during this blog. What is the process or what are the questions or considerations that I run through uh, when considering whether to invest in a particular opportunity or asset class or product or investment or whatever it might be? Uh, And hopefully uh, what I'd like to do is invite you to um, uh, employ the same or very similar approach Um, But really, the core theme is uh, be particularly diligent, and it's really probably what you don't invest in that will determine your outcomes rather than what you do invest in. That is, uh, avoiding making really poor quality investments is uh, more than half the battle, I think, in regards to building wealth. Okay, so there's five questions that I ask myself when contemplating an investment, and the first one is, will it materially improve uh, my or your financial position Uh, in 10 years from now. Because it's often tempting, very tempting I think sometimes, uh, to invest in opportunities that um, promise or allude you to thinking that there's going to be uh, quick investment returns. Um, And of course doing that really appeals to our desire for instant gratification or instant reward uh, as opposed to delayed gratification is a, a much more difficult skill to uh, uh, to work on. And I think one of my favourite quotes is from a guy called Howard Schultz. Uh, he's a billionaire and he, he's the person that founded the Starbucks uh, coffee empire. And he says something, um, I could be paraphrasing here, something along the lines of that short-term profit really creates or translates into long-term value. And I really like the quote because I think it's very, very true. Very simple quote, uh, but incredibly powerful. Now, uh, Howard was uh, typically talking about business, you know, about creating a, a long, uh, you know, a very valuable business and that it's not about uh, just striving for short-term profitability, but you can apply it equally well to uh, investing. Now, if I give you a, a fantastic stock tip, Uh, that if you invest in this stock, you can double your money within the next two weeks. Is that one little bit of information going to help you build uh, wealth over the long run, over the next 30 years? No, of course not. It'll be give you a, it's a sugar hit. It'll give you a shot in the arm. It's a great outcome. Of course, uh, if you gave someone a guaranteed idea to double their money uh, over the next two weeks, they're not going to be disappointed with you. You're not going to be disappointed with the idea. But unless I can come up with that idea every two weeks or let's say every month and be consistently right every single time, uh, it's really just not going to translate into building wealth. Whereas instead, if you invest in an asset that just provides predictable and sustainable returns over a very long period of time, you're much better off. Like a 7% return over the next 30 years will see the investment uh, be worth 7.6 times its value. So $100 invested today uh, in 30 years will be worth nearly $800 uh, in 30 years time. Now, uh, $100 is no big deal, but invest a million dollars and all of a sudden you can see how uh, you can build tremendous wealth. And really what you want is assets that generate wealth while you sleep. You know, ideas, uh, stock picking ideas as an example, Uh, They take intellectual property, you know, you need to know where to get the ideas from, you need to formulate them, you need to make sure that they're they're consistently right. Whereas if you just buy an asset and hold it for 30 years and enjoy 7% total return, you don't need to do anything and it makes money while you sleep. So um, I think that asking yourself the question, uh, will it 
ch- materially change my financial position in 10 years' time is incredibly powerful because it, what it does is it invites you to fe- forget about the opportunities that are really just shiny objects, you know, a bit of short-term profit, and then really focus on the fundamentals because 10 years is long enough um, so that popularity doesn't play a role in your investment decisions. It's about, fundam- about fundamentals, um, but not too long that it becomes... Um, difficult to get your head around. You know, 10-year period is long. It's a lot of time, but not a ridiculous amount of time. Ironically, the thing I find is the older we get, uh, the easier it is to make long-term decisions. And maybe it's just because we get better at um, dealing with delayed gratification. Um, But either way, I think it does require a good dose of uh, discipline and patience. And that discipline and patience is very well rewarded uh, when it comes to investing. Okay, the second question I ask myself is, do you understand what's driving these expected returns and does it make sense? Uh, So I strongly believe that you shouldn't ever invest in anything you don't understand, which is not to say you need to understand the intricacies of every single investment, but you really do need to um, have a broad understanding of how the investment is going to be going to work. How are the returns generated? Does it make sense? Is it common sense? Um, And I don't think that there's really anything that goes on in the investment world that can't be explained uh, in simple terms uh, using basic logic. And that's what I'm talking about, making sure the logic really stacks up. Um, So for example, if we're investing in a blue chip property in a highly sought after area, um, and we hold that property for 30 years, it makes sense that such a great location is always going to be sought after, that it's going to enjoy price appreciation. Now, we don't know how much it will appreciate over the next 30 years, but it's probably reasonable to expect uh, that it's going to be better than average. And so investing in a, uh, such an asset, it makes sense to where the capital growth is going to come from. Whereas if you compare, say, uh, to another asset like Bitcoin, uh, for example, now I understand uh, what Bitcoin could be used for. Um, You know, I understand the advantages of having a sort of decentralized currency and that offers anonymity, you know, privacy and so forth. But the reality is at the moment, the vast majority of people buying Bitcoin are buying it for speculative purposes, not actually fundamentally, not actually fundamentally using it as an alternative currency. So therefore, the only way I can make a return by investing in Bitcoin is if there's an increasing number of speculators willing to come into the market because they think it's going to be worth more tomorrow. Now, that, that's a very thin layer of demand, uh, a very volatile layer of demand, and it feels very risky to me and it feels like more like speculation than investing, and I'm not interested in speculating. So that's why it's important to understand where is the invest, how can this, if this investment's going to work, what needs to go right, uh, and is that logical or is it risky? You know, are you throwing darts at a dartboard or is it really just based on sound, you know, supply and demand indicators and those sorts of things? Okay, the third question is, and a very important one, where is the evidence? Uh, Show me the evidence. There's no need to throw darts at a dartboard. There's plenty of investment opportunities out there, and that's asset classes or investment methodologies that we can utilize that offer really good long-term returns. You know, uh, share markets, for example, over the last four decades have generated around 10% growth. So of property markets. Now, you don't need much more than 10% per annum over very long periods of time to generate significant wealth. And there's an overwhelming body of evidence in a lot of those asset classes that this approach or that approach or this way of selecting assets, etc. works. Uh, So there's no need to try and invent or follow an unproven strategy. But also what's more is that when if you're contemplating something that isn't fundamentally sound, it's likely the evidence won't be there. So when you go and look for the evidence, if, if there's an absence of evidence, then you know that it's a, a relatively good indicator that perhaps this investment isn't the one for you, that it's not necessarily going to work. But also, by the same token, evidence isn't necessarily a guarantee that it's going to work in the future, which is why we have the four other questions that I ask is really understanding results and returns and so forth. So evidence by itself isn't uh, an overwhelming or the most compelling uh, factor to consider. Um, But if there's no evidence, then uh, I would uh, almost always uh, bow out of that investment, not, not pursue it. 
Okay, the fourth question, which is really important to ask, of course, is uh, who's making the money and how much? Uh, so no, virtually no one promotes investments just for the fun of it. They're not doing it for free. Uh, anyone that's promoting a particular investment is doing it because they have a commercial incentive to do it. So it's important to understand what is, uh, incentives exist, who is going to benefit and by how much. Um, and that way you can then uh, make an assessment of uh, is this actually going to ultimately generate value for me? Because there's no um, problem with commercial interest per se. I mean, people should be fairly rewarded, a fair exchange of value. If they're providing some value to you, uh, then it's fair that they're remunerated for that. Um, but what you need to do is make an assessment of whether it is fair, uh, whether there is a fair exchange of value. Because in some situations, uh, people have vested interests and it really comes at the cost of the investor. So a good example of this is uh, some property developers pay you know, sub substantial commissions to anyone that recommends uh, off-the-plan property th to their clients. You know, it can be you know, $30,000, $40,000 sometimes per transaction. Um, now, when the developer sits down and works out, okay, what can they sell these properties for, they, they take into account, they'll factor in the fact that they've got to pay this thirty, forty thousand dollars $40,000 commission at the end of the day. Now, the, the person that receives the commission obviously gets the value, um, but the, ultimately the, the person buying the property is the one that's left overpaying for a particular property just because those commissions have been factored in. So there's a cost there, but there's no value in return. And that's why it's important to really understand uh, who's benefiting from the transaction, what are the fees payable, and is it a fair exchange in value? And where that's not fully transparent, where when people aren't going to be open uh, in that regard to you, then uh, I would proceed with um, absolute caution uh, because sometimes that's a red flag for uh, potentially people um, benefiting to a great extent at your expense. Okay, and the fifth question I ask, and, and by the way, these questions are in no particular order. They're probably equally important as each other. But the fifth question I ask is, what could go wrong? Uh, you know, I find most investors um, uh, are very keen to consider the possible returns from an investment, but fail to consider the risks. Well, I like to be, I like to do it the other way around. I would first like to identify everything that can go wrong. And then I think about ways, if there's any ways to possibly reduce or eliminate or mitigate some of those risks. Uh, and then once I've done that, then I'll think about uh, the returns because it's really easy to fall in love with returns and hard, hard to then talk yourself out of that uh, when you look at risks. So you're better off to look at risk first before you start falling in love with any returns. And as Warren Buffett says, you know, the first rule of investing is don't lose money. Rule number two is refer to rule number one. And so thinking about risk, thinking about your downside and minimizing risk as much as possible goes a long way to delivering on that, that rule of investing, which is not losing any money. And the real genius with investing is trying to achieve a high return whilst only taking a low risk because normally are positively correlated, which means that if you want to generate a higher return, normally you have to accept a higher risk. But it is possible to structure an investment or even an investment portfolio in a way by taking steps in a way to reduce or minimize your risk while still preserving the high return. Uh, and that's really when you can turn that investment equation, that risk return investment equation on its head uh, and use it to your advantage. So focusing on risk and minimizing risk uh, makes your risk weighted return uh, look a lot better. So the premise or the theme of this topic, this, this podcast topic is really to be really diligent about what you invest in. Um, you're better off to say no more often than you say yes. Be really careful and prudent with your money. Um, but when you find a great investment opportunity, of course, you should pursue it with absolute confidence. I guess what I'm saying is have patience and sometimes the best thing is to do nothing. If there's no greater investment opportunities in front of you, then just sit on your cash. Don't do anything. You're in no rush. I'm sure in a couple of months time or even no more than a year, I'm sure a great investment opportunity will come along. And I'm reminded by a study that a global fund manager, Fidelity, um, uh, produced a, a while ago. What they did is they had a look at who had the best performing accounts over a 10-year period. It was between 2003 and 2013. So the study's a bit old, but still uh, relevant today. And uh, 
perhaps surprisingly, uh, they identified the people that did the best, their investors that did the best, are the ones that had inactive accounts. So an inactive account was where they lost login details or, in fact, forgotten that the account existed, and they generated the best returns. So I guess what it demonstrates is that, firstly, our event, our intervention on investments, changing and tinkering and all those sorts of things really adds value and in fact detracts from value, but it also demonstrates the, the benefit of patience. Uh, that is, you've got to have the patience to find the right investment opportunities. There's no point to rush. And then you need to have the patience to hold the right investment opportunities. And both those things can be very difficult because we, for some reason, have this thing in the back of our head that we should be doing something. We should be making some sort of changes. But quite often, the best thing is to do nothing. Just sit back. It might take a couple of decades and let the assets do all the heavy lifting. Okay, that's it for me for this week. If you enjoy the podcast, please leave a rating, share it among friends, family and colleagues. Uh, The more the merrier, of course. And until next week, bye for now.